welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. There's one super antioxidant you're probably getting every day without even knowing it. In fact, it's been shown to help fight inflammation, boost your energy, and protect the health of your brain. And studies show it can make a huge difference for the health of your entire body. I'm talking about hydrogen. Yeah, the most abundant element in the universe. The same thing that's in the air you breathe and the water you drink. And there's a really easy way to supercharge this molecule to reduce inflammation, boost recovery, support a healthy heart, and improve the appearance of your skin. Whoa. And my guest today is going to tell you all about it. He's Tyler W. LeBaron the founder and executive director of the science-based nonprofit Molecular Hydrogen Institute. And today he's going to explain the cutting edge research on hydrogen and how it can help you feel healthier than you have in years. And actually, I'm really excited about this episode. I had the pleasure of talking with Tyler uh, a few months ago and stay tuned, this is really good. So Tyler, welcome to the Dr. Gundry yeah. podcast. My pleasure, thank you. Great to have you here. All right, so very basic question to start with. What in the world is molecular hydrogen and what effect does it have on our bodies? Yeah, most important question. Um, molecular hydrogen, we are referring to hydrogen gas. So it's, an, it's a molecule. And often, so you look at water, water is a molecule and it has the oxygen and hydrogen. So it's like Mickey Mouse, you know, it has the oxygen here and the two hydrogens. And those hydrogens are attached to the oxygen. And so just as we can't, you know, drink water to get the oxygen that we need, we also can't drink water to get that type of hydrogen. The hydrogen gas that we're talking about is a gas. It's, it's the alternative energy source that everybody's after, right? Because it's three times more energy, energy dense than gasoline. So what happens is you have a hydrogen atom that has a proton electron and another hydrogen atom that has a proton electron and they marry each other, right? They, they combine together to form the H2 molecule. So this is the smallest molecule in the universe, smaller than oxygen, and, and that allows it to easily enter into our cells. And so talking about cellular bioavailability, for example, I mean, obviously, if you want to get the benefit of something, it actually has to get inside of the cell, right? Good point. Well, hydrogen gas being so small can actually do that. Um, so that's what we're talking about, hydrogen gas, molecular hydrogen, or dihydrogen. Okay, so you know you bring up a good point. So there's hydrogen in water, so why not just drink water and then we'll get that hydrogen? It just won't come off? Exactly, yeah, it, well, it doesn't come off. It, it doesn't just come off like that. Water stays as the H2O molecule and we have to get that H2 gas. That, that's why water's not explosive, but hydrogen gas is explosive. We actually use water to put out a fire. And so all these, you know, the propulsion systems that are, you know. Yeah, rocket fuel. Rocket fuel uses hydrogen. Yeah, hydrogen and oxygen. They combust together to form water. And that's why even our hydrogen powered cars drip water yeah, out, out, right. out of the tailpipe, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, so what, I mean, come on, let's get down and dirty. What effect is hydrogen, the gas, having at the cellular level? Get, get nerdy and teach us a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's, we don't know all the exact mechanisms of how hydrogen gas is working at that molecular you know, biological level. Um, we, we first, we can look at some of the observations. That's the first step in science is first demonstrate that a phenomena is actually occurring. And so, in, in the earliest research, uh, starting in Asia, for example, um, you, you administer hydrogen gas, uh, whether it's dissolved in water or through inhalation, and you're seeing these, these effects, such as um, prevention of the development of Parkinson's disease in an animal model. Or you, you look at markers of inflammation, and you see clearly that hydrogen gas decreases inflammation, or oxidative stress, right? This is, this is another huge one. Um, and, and I'm sure everyone's familiar, like when you cut the apple in half and it turns brown or rust, that's ox oxygen or oxidation. And every single time that we breathe, we're starting to slowly oxidize ourselves. And hydrogen also helps to decrease that excessive oxidation that's going on that leads to the aging and many diseases. So the mechanism by how that's happening, 
Um, it still remains a little bit elusive, but what we do see, for example, the hydrogen gas, in, in terms of, like, say, the free radical and, anti and antioxidant aspect, hydrogen gas is able to activate what's called the NRF2 keep one pathway. Um, and, and you're probably familiar with that with, with, like, with what you've done before with the plants and everything. It's a very important pathway. Uh, it, it's, what, it's the transcription factor that when it activates the, the genes in, in the DNA, it essentially it regulates over two or three hundred cytoprotective proteins and enzymes that are involved in uh, antioxidation, detoxification, and so you have your proteins like glutathione, people have heard before if it's peptide, um, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, all of these that are our body's own or our endogenous antioxidant self-defense system. And taking hydrogen gas able to activate this pathway which in turn um, upregulates or increases our body's natural antioxidant self-defense system. And that's one of the ways that hydrogen gas is working to offer some of these benefits that we're seeing in the preclinical and clinical studies. Okay, now I know you trained uh, over in Asia uh, to learn most of this, and as we've talked before, there's like over 1,100 research papers, primarily in Korean and Japan, uh, and even China, written on the effect of molecular hydrogen, yes? Yeah, yeah, there's probably about 1,500 publications so far on the benefits of molecular hydrogen. Um, then probably around 80 clinical, human clinical studies that have been conducted so far. Of course, most of them, most of the studies are in animals because that's how science progresses, right? But, but when you consider that actually a, a good article takes between three to five years from conception to publication. I mean, it, it's a lot of work to study, to do an article and do all the research over and over Don't again. Don't I know. Right? Yeah. I mean, it takes a long time. So when you consider that 2007 started the, the, the whole area of hydrogen research, if you will, and now you know, 12 years later, there's around 1,500 publications, um, that's, that's exciting, actually. I mean, it's not a lot, but the fact that it's that many in that short amount of time, yeah, it's, it's, it's growing exponentially. I got interested in this, actually, before I even met you, um, reading a paper, a human clinical trial, that uh, molecular hydrogen water uh, actually reduced oxidized LDL in human beings, and actually quite dramatically. And I went, wow, yeah. now, that's pretty cool. Um, and so what you're saying is, the, the, at least what we think is happening is, so this is activating the NERF pathway mm -hmm. in RF2 and having us produce more of our own intrinsic antioxidants, right? And just as an aside, there's another new paper uh, that was presented at the American Heart Association this past week that shows that LDL cholesterol has nothing to do with anything in terms of causing heart disease. It's actually the small, dense LDLs mm -hmm. that get oxidized. Oxidized small, dense LDLs. Exactly, that yeah. are in fact the troublemaker. And our whole shift of our research and our treatment should be to prevent oxidized LDL. And so, again, I'm intrigued because, wait a minute, I, I can drink a glass of water with hydrogen in it and lower my oxidized LDL. Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, there, there are several clinical studies that, that demonstrate, um, and some really powerful animal studies. In fact, one of them um, in a APOE protein knockout mice. So APOE protein is, is very important to um, basically get rid of the, the bad cholesterol, if you will. And if you don't have that protein, you're gonna develop atherosclerosis very quickly, for sure. Well, in, in this animal study, the drinking of hydrogen-rich water totally prevented the development of atherosclerosis. And so that probably, you know, it tr was then translated into humans that uh, that might be paper you're talking about where they were drinking hydrogen water and you, yeah, you be able to see um, less oxidized LDL. Um, and, and also we see benefits like with the macrophages, because that's what happens in the, in the, when the LDL gets into the, the um, you know, in, into the intima, for Correct. example, and then the macrophages come and they get oxidized and just this cascade. And, that, and hydrogen gas, like we talked about, is the smallest molecule in the universe. So it has no problem getting in th th through the cell membranes to where it needs to go. And now it can help to, to mitigate that oxidation. So that's one area. But then there's inflammation because those macrophages, 
Um, they're sending out cytokines, those are pro-inflammatory cytokines, and that's going to all these other signalings, and it's going to cause all this, this problem. Well, hydrogen gas is another area that it really helps to suppress uh, um, or mitigate excessive inflammation. It can, if, for, for example, when TNF-alpha, it's a cytokine, yep. activates NFKB. Measure in all my patients. Well, yeah, so when that gets high, that's going to activate this transcription factor NFKB. NFKB is going to just huge inflammatory marker. Well, molecular hydrogen can, can down-regulate um, NFKB or NF-kappa B. But, but anyways, when that's down-regulated, um, you're going to have less inflammation. And so we see both on the areas of uh, antioxidation and the anti-inflammatory effects of hydrogen, that could help account for some of these observed benefits. Now, dumb question. Uh, hydrogen has been around forever. Uh, and we've been sending rockets. <laughs> literally uh, forever. Literally <laughs> forever, that's right. It, since, it, since the it, dawn of the universe. The dawn, yeah. That's right. It, it, it was the number one. <laughs> yeah. What prompted anybody to say, gee, we should look at, at hydrogen in this way? I yeah, mean, it's who fascinating. Had the, who, who had the crazy idea? Yeah, well, and, and actually it's interesting because we, you would think if hydrogen gas does have this amazing biological benefits that we're starting to potentially discover, we, we should already know about that, right? Um, but, but there's a couple interesting things. So first, m maybe, maybe we did know about it, we just didn't pay attention. So there was a paper, uh, it was a book that was written by an, an Italian medical doctor in 1798, I mean just a little bit after hydrogen was even named and discovered. And it was this, this in inhalation of, ex of uh, basically exotic gases. And in this, there's a small description that he talks about, the inhalation of hydrogen gas has an anti-inflammatory effect. That was, that was so long ago. Hmm. And then, fast forward, and then in 1975, there was an article by Texas A&M Texas and Baylor University published in Science. I mean, that, you don't get a journal more prestigious True. than Science, True. right? And, and they found that uh, hyperbaric hydrogen treatment was very effective with uh, these melanoma t skin tumors, basically. It just totally regressed the, the growth of the tumor. It was amazing. Um, probably, though, it's not really feasible to do hyperbaric hydrogen therapy for a human just because hydrogen gas is explosive. It's going to be the Hindenburg all over, Exactly. Right? So I think what happened then is, so in 2005, um, people, you know, they were looking, okay, we have the, the hydrogen gas being produced by our intestinal bacteria. Right. Maybe this is going to be therapeutic. So there's a lot of converging ideas that got to this concept that maybe hydrogen does have biological effect. So 2005, and I, I talked to Dr. Ota, um, he, he's the one who published this Nature of Medicine publication in 2007, and, and this was his story. He thought it, he heard about it, he was a mitochondrial researcher, and he's like, okay, well, let's, let's try it. And so they did. In 2005, they started, and they found that actually, yeah, it did have these therapeutic effects. So they did more studies, and they published that paper in 2007 in Nature Medicine, again, a top publication. But, but the interesting thing, though, is in that publication, he showed that at physiologically and clinically relevant concentrations, so below the flammability level, and, and at uh, levels that you could do in a clinic, so it's not going to explode, but it can still be therapeutic, is still beneficial for you. And that, when that paper was published, now that's what got the research to just kind of skyrocket. So there's a lot of research after that. So that's maybe my explanation is one, there has been a lot of research that's been done. Well, not a lot, but it has been suggested for a long time, but no one's really paid attention to it. And, and then two, the research's not really relevant at the time because people thought, well, yeah, but you can't really, it's not really clinically viable. But now we're seeing, uh, actually, it can be very clinically viable and to, to, to the point that we're at now. So now, wait a minute. So most of the air we breathe is hydrogen. It, hydrogen, yes, is in the air, right? right. But the percentage, so air, air has about you know, 80%, 79% nitrogen, 20, right. 21% uh, oxygen. Oxygen. And then the hydrogen concentration is, let's see, 0 0.000055%. So not much. It's not enough to exert any therapeutic effect, right? Okay. The, con the concentration in our cells is not going to be high enough, right? So what you're saying is if I could make, have bacteria uh, fart hydrogen, <laughs> um, then that's one of the theories on why yeah. having fermenting bacteria producing this stuff might be good. 
Yeah, actually, that was, I said it, like in, in, uh, in one of the earlier publications, I think in the 80s, it was suggested, hey, hydrogen gas has a very, very low um, re reductive potential, mm -hmm. even lower than glutathione. Maybe it has a biological effect. We should check this out. Um, then in the, see, the Forsyth Institute in, there in Boston, Massachusetts, they did a study um, with lactulose. So lactulose is a non-digestible carbohydrate, yep. right? But it's also basically medicine. And what, but when it's metabolized by the intestinal bacteria, it produces lots of hydrogen gas. Correct. So what they did in the study is they, they took E. coli and did a genetic knockout on the hydrogenase enzyme. So the, the bacteria could metabolize the E. coli, but upon metabolism, it would not produce hydrogen gas. So when they administered uh, lactulose, the hepato or, or liver protective effects of lactulose, totally gone. Interesting. But when they gave the um, hydrogenase positive E. coli back in, so now the E. coli could metabolize the lactulose, but this time produce hydrogen gas, um, so very significant hepatoprotective effects. So suggesting, like you, like you said, that maybe a lot of the, the fibers that we are eating, um, those benefits are mediated by the endogenous production of hydrogen gas. So now there's these large clinical reviews from um, you know, huge journals, huge populations looking at uh, taking different carbohydrates, uh, different medications, and, and, and actually measuring the production of hydrogen gas and showing that, yeah, there appears to be a correlation that those who are taking, um, getting more hydrogen gas produced by the intestinal bacteria uh, seem to thrive and survive and, 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 and live longer and live better. Okay, so uh, I'm pretty convinced, and that's why you're here, that molecular hydrogen is the, is the real deal. So how, how in the world do you get the full range of benefits of molecular hydrogen? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Of course, still earlier on part of, in part of the research, again, the preliminary um, studies and preclinical and clinical studies are very promising. But, but, but the fact is, I mean, we, st we still don't really know, um, you know how effective is hydrogen gas really, like in the clinical sense in this specific disease. Uh, you know, th there's no 10-year study, you know, really demonstrating beyond um, you know, a shadow of a doubt, if you will, that, that hydrogen gas has a therapeutic effect. Um, it has a high safety profile, so if people want to try it, I feel like that's, that's great, you know, and the research is very promising. Um, but, but there's different ways to get the hydrogen gas, right? One of them... So how do we do it? Yeah, one of them is, uh, of course, inhalation of hydrogen gas, and that's actually the, the Japanese government um, a couple of years ago approved inhalation of hydrogen gas as an advanced medicine for the treatment of post-cardiac arrest syndrome. And, and this is just as a side tangent, because this is pretty powerful. The, the reason why is because typically when you, when you stop the heart for a surgery or something, you do a therapeutic hypothermia. Because if you don't, this, as an, an animal study looked at this, um, then let's say there's only 43% survival. That is what, what this one study was showing. 43% survival if you don't do the therapeutic hypothermia. By doing the therapeutic hypothermia, it increased to say 77% survival. So it's a big deal. That, that's why it's the standard protocol, right? So in the same study, they, they use hydrogen gas instead of therapeutic hypothermia in, in, with this group, and the in survival increased to 92% with hydrogen gas. Better than Even better than therapeutic the hypothermia, yeah. exactly. And then when they combine the two, hypothermia with hydrogen gas is 100% survival, which you can't actually beat 100%. So uh, preclinical studies and others, as well as other now clinical studies, are showing this is really good. So the government in Japan approved this as a class 2B medical device, and now they're doing a very large study with 360 patients and maybe 20 different hospitals um, to see the true effects of, of the hydrogen gas in, in these clinical settings. And in fact, even here in the, in the USA, um, there's, there's work towards uh, getting FDA approval for, for an, uh, an IND, an investigative new drug, to study hydrogen gas for, for pretty much the same, the same idea during extracorporeal circulation for during, during a heart surgery. Um, actually, you and I talked about that earlier yeah. when I was doing research with the heart transplant, so we can talk about that later. But anyway, I inhalation of hydrogen gas is one of the ways to get it. And you can actually buy these machines. They're expensive. I actually have several patients who have purchased oh, is that right? these machines for home use. Yeah. Uh, but that's... Yeah, you have to be cautious because, again, uh, you don't know how much hydrogen gas are you really getting into the body, for example, because 
you know, typically in the clinical research, you know, it's, it's around 3% hydrogen gas, but that's the total amount going to the body. You have to look at the total production milliliters uh, produced per minute and then compare that to your breathing rate and all this stuff. But then you have to be cautious because it is explosive. You know, so th there's a lot of things. This is a, a very new emerging industry. So don't have a cigarette while you're while uh, you're inhaling, uh, inhaling, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, or so. don't inhale. I, or, I've or, heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's yeah, exactly. Okay, so all right, so that's not practical. It, at least, yeah, it, it's not. I mean, it it there it it depends. I mean, you know, tomato, tomato. You it can be done, and people do do it. But I'm just saying, if you're gonna try that. Uh, just be careful about it. That, that's all. Don't don't just think, oh, it's no problem. And just you know, just just do your research. So inhalation is one way. Okay. There's there's also intravenous hydrogen-rich saline injection, um, which uh, is interesting and has some potential, some great effects. And and but a very practical and probably the easiest way and the most common way done in research is simply taking the gas and infusing or dissolving it into water and then drinking it because. As far as I know, everyone drinks water anyway, so it's pretty pretty simple to incorporate into your life. Is just drink hydrogen-rich water. Okay, so wait a minute. Now we're going to bubble the hydrogen into water, and why won't that combine with the water to make more water? Excellent question. So when you dissolve the gas into the water, it it just dissolves it into the water. It doesn't react with the water to form like H3O or H4O or some novel structure. Um, again, if you take hydrogen and oxygen and put them t together. They actually don't ignite or explode unless you light a match, unless you light a fire, right? That's so. So that's why you can dissolve it into the water. The problem with dissolving it in the water is, as soon as it's dissolved, you do need to drink it quickly because it'll just go right back out. And and that's my point. It doesn't it does not attach to the water molecule or anything like that? It doesn't change the pH. Doesn't do anything like that. So once it's dissolved in there and you make your hydrogen water, you you need to drink it. So what I I can make some hydrogen water, but if I, for instance, put it in my plastic uh, water container, what's going to happen? Yeah, if, if and you can do that, but again, because hydrogen gas is the smallest molecule, eventually, it, yeah, it'll go right through those the, the plastic containers. Now there are some ready-to-drink products, but they, there's specifically done, you know, using aluminum type containers, you know, cans or pouches. But right. you have to be very cautious with all of that. Right. Um, so, anyways, that can be done, but in terms of like plastic and things like that, yeah, it, ju it just goes right through. Okay. So, if I go on Amazon, I can find lots of hydrogen water generators for home use. Most of them come from Korea or Japan. Yeah, China. Or China. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Um, how, what's the Latin word? A caveat impetur, right? Uh, right? Buyer beware. Right. Um, yeah, some of those may may work uh, in order to get you dissolved hydrogen. But s see, for me, I mean, I'm I'm really mostly focused on on the research on, of of hydrogen, and so I do have some experience with some of looking at some of these products. And and the problem is, a lot of companies want to use the medical literature of hydrogen to sell their product, um, which you know, again, scientifically, I would say, well, how much research do we really have, or whatever. But, but even more importantly, is is the product that they are selling? Does it actually provide the therapeutic doses or concentrations that we're using in research? And often the case is no, it, they're they're not. So a lot of these products you're talking about, uh, they they use electrolysis, right? And they so have these electrodes on there. And some of the problems there, if they don't have the right membrane. Um, then maybe they're going to get ozone produced, chlorine produced during, during oxidation because chloride will be oxidized to chlorine gas. So you'd be drinking that. Maybe the electrodes aren't fully clean or they're not fully inert with uh, platinum, for example. And so you get maybe, I don't know, electrode uh, material, heavy metals type in there. Um, and then even if all of that is no problem and everything's working fine, well then, I, I've just I, I've seen and heard there's problems often with consistency of how long the product's actually lasting. You first get it, makes a good concentration. Although most of them only make like very low concentration, like 0.2 to to one milligram per liter or, or ppm. Um, and what do we need? Yeah, well, we, we what don't. are the studies? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. We we don't actually know what we need. Okay. Um, but but we do know what the, what we have used in clinical studies to show therapeutic effects. Okay. Right? That, so that's a good. Yeah. So benchmark. we want to exactly yes. Okay. I'm gonna get back to that. I just wanted to say about these those those units really quickly. 
often there's lots of problems with the quality control. Even after a couple of weeks or months, they, might, may, they may stop working, start producing those therapeutic levels. So you always have to constantly be testing and measuring the concentration. They, they can work fine, but you just have to be very um, uh, you know, vigorous in terms of testing and making sure it's still working, right, to get that therapeutic level or dose. And what is that dose and level? Again, we don't, we don't really know, but what, what are we using in the clinical studies showing the therapeutic effect? And, and that concentration is typically between, uh, well, as low as 0 0.5 ppm or 0 0.5 milligrams per liter, but it's very rare, and, and some studies show there's no benefit there. Uh, but most of them are around 1.6 milligrams per liter or 1.6 ppm. And, and some of them are as high as, you know, 5 or, you know, 7 uh, milligrams per liter, you know, or, or even higher than that. And so it, it appears from some of the human research, but a lot of the animal and cell culture studies, that in some cases, not every case, but at least in some cases, or maybe even many cases, there is a dose-dependent effect. So, so the higher the dose of hydrogen, uh, the more likely or the higher the probability that it'll exert a bi biological effect and be beneficial. At least there's never a time, um, at least in, in the research that I've done or I've seen, where a lower concentration is either less effective as a high concentration. So basically, a, a high dose of hydrogen is either as effective as or more effective than a low dose. Ah, so, okay. so in research, we typically want to just give high dose because it's very safe. It doesn't, there's no toxic buildup in your body. You can't OD on hydrogen, if you will. And so getting a high dose of hydrogen it just ensures the probability that you're, you're, you're in the bell curve, if you will, that you're going to get benefits if there are benefits to be had. So I can't possibly explode by drinking molecular <laughs> hydrogen water. Right, yeah. You, you would get hyponatremia from drinking <laughs> too much water. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about, I know a lot of people say, well, I drink alkaline water. Oh, yeah. And that's the same as hydrogen water. Yeah. Take yeah. it. Well, yeah, that, that's a common misconception, the conflation of the concept of alkaline water with hydrogen water. And, and possibly because when we think of alkaline water, we think of high pH and pH potential hydrogen. Hey, we're talking about hydrogen. The more hydrogen, the more alkaline, right? But it's actually almost the opposite, the opposite. And, and very different. Uh, uh, pH is potential hydrogen, of course, the P is more of, of an exponent, an inverse exponent, a logarithmic function. And the hydrogen they're talking about is not hydrogen gas, molecular hydrogen, but the hydrogen ion, which has no electrons, it's just an H plus, it's a proton, right? And so pH, that H in pH has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, and we're talking about molecular hydrogen, this hydrogen gas. And when you take, dissolve hydrogen gas into water, it doesn't change the pH. So there's, there's, there's no connection at all between the alkaline water aspect and the hydrogen water. They're, they're, they're totally different. Now, there is a, a correlation some of the early research, which is a very interesting story, because some, some of the early research, they found that this what's called alkaline ionized water uh, actually had some therapeutic effects. And it's like, how, how does this happen? Because an alkaline water, alkaline pH, is not going to benefit the human body. Correct. I mean, we, I mean, you know, yeah, we are alkaline. Our bodies are alkaline, but alkal but water is not a buffer. And to put it in perspective, um, one teaspoon of baking soda, a little teaspoon of baking soda, which is actually you know sodium bicarbonate, our body's natural buffering system, a teaspoon of baking soda can neutralize as much acid as 700 liters of alkaline water at a at a pH of 10. So. You, you can't drink say, enough. Say that again, because it, it, yeah. the most important part of this podcast may have just been said. I want you to say it again. <laughs> yeah, so, so one teaspoon of baking soda can neutralize as much acid as 700 liters of alkaline water at a pH of 10. Come on. Right, right. So that alkaline water thing that I'm buying at the store for $3, uh, it, I'm, I'm better off having, you know, a, a pinch of baking. Or, or just breathing a little bit more, right? Because as you breathe, that, that's how we control our, our pH the best is by respiration. So True. if you just excel out the CO2, yeah, you would, get, you would increase your blood pH more if that's what your goal was, if you would just excel more. So, so it doesn't work. But, but then that, so, so that question then was, well, then why were these studies on alkaline ionized water why were they showing this antioxidant effect, anti-cancer anti effect, anti-diabetic effect, anti-inflammatory, whatever these effects were? Like, how do you explain this? Because it doesn't make sense that 
water could do this it would, despite it having an alkaline pH. So there were stuff put about like, oh, it's you know, microclustering, structuring, enigmatic, you know, stuff. But that none of that has, is, is valid, and, and the evidence that people have reported are just, just don't work. But what it turns out is when you make this alkaline ionized water using electrolysis, which by definition is the decomposition of water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, during that electrolytic process, this, some of that hydrogen gas that's produced ends up getting dissolved in the water. So when you drink alkaline ionized water, fresh alkaline ionized water, you may be, not all the time because different machines and you know, calcification stuff, but you may be getting small amounts of dissolved hydrogen gas, which are responsible for those therapeutic effects. And in fact, we did a study on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We took uh, rodents and we, we gave them alkaline ionized water. Okay, the real story is it's really interesting. But th these researchers, they took alkaline ionized water because they were like, wow, this is really cool. So they're, they're, they're like, let's figure out if this is true, like all this stuff. They took alkaline ionized water and they compared it to control water and they did the study and guess what? No benefit, nothing. And they're like, why is this not working? And they were, they're like, they, they were so sure that it would because they followed the protocol everything else did. So they ended up talking to me and we, and we, we talked for quite a while and they're like, okay, let's do it again. And I was like, but, but what is the hydrogen concentration? And they're like, oh, we, we don't know. And so we measured the concentration of hydrogen. It was quite low, it was like 0.3 milligrams per liter, 0.3 ppm. And so, okay, let's do the exact same study, but let's do a, um, also a low concentration around the 0.3 milligrams per liter and also a high concentration of, of hydrogen. And, and high just means higher. It was only like one ppm or something, maybe okay. lower than that. We did the study and same thing, the low concentration of alkaline ionized water. So again, high pH, had this you know, negative ORP that people talk about, you know, all this stuff, had everything, zero benefit. But the, but the higher concentration of hydrogen, very significant, obvious benefit. On, on non alcoholic fatty liver disease in this animal study. And then actually, I, I, we later, with another group, we did a clinical trial on non alcoholic fatty liver disease and very, very, very positive results. Wow. So, all right. So, we're not going to breathe it. Are the machines, maybe, maybe not. How at home can we do it? I mean, can we, are there tablets that'll do this? Yeah, I mean, there, there are, in fact, that study I just mentioned that uh, non alcoholic liver disease, we, we actually use the tablets because we, we're, we wanted to see, okay, a higher dose of hydrogen, how it's going to work. So we use actually dual echo MRI technology to actually measure the liver, the fat deposits in the liver and saw these benefits. But um, in a study, we actually used these hydrogen producing tablets. And I say hydrogen producing because, of course, a tablet. It's not, it's not a hydrogen tablet, right? Like a solid hydrogen or something. <laughs> but, but the way the tablets work is that they contain a special form of reactive metallic magnesium that when you add to the water, it reacts with water, H2O, and it kind of liberates that H2, right? And so you produce the hydrogen gas. And you can see all the bubbles coming off. And if you want to get, um, you can get a lighter and light it on fire. You know, it's, it's kind of fun to do sometimes <laughs> when you're bored. <laughs> Careful, do not do this <laughs> yeah, at home. Yeah. Professional <laughs> researcher on a closed course. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but, but yeah, so those tablets are, you know, they, they, I find value in them for the research because we get a high dose of hydrogen. Um, I, think, I think also because, of course, we use a placebo tablet also that gives us the same amount of magnesium, but I think just ah, for the general okay. consumer, I think it's also nice because most people are deficient in magnesium anyways, True. and so they're able to get some magnesium that way. So should you, uh, we talked off camera, should you do this all day, every day, every time you drink water, put a tablet in, or should you dose yourself once a day, or break it up? What's your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, first off, we, we still... Well, thanks for being honest. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, and even more honestly, I'm very excited about the hydrogen research. Don't, don't get me wrong, but my disclaimer is still, we, we still don't really know. I mean, we, like I said, there's no 10-year long-term clinical trial, three, five million dollars, you know, unequivocally showing something. Like, I'm excited about this because the prospects of it being therapeutic and beneficial that we see in cell culture, tissues, animals, and humans are very promising. There's lots of them from many research and many groups, and I'm just, I'm just one mere small person you know, in, in, in the midst of academia do, doing some research. I mean, I'm not, you know, I have only have so many publications. There's a lot more out there. And so I, I'm excited because it's very safe and has a great potential. So with that being said, uh, what is the best way of dosing, if you will, on the hydrogen? Um, again, I don't know on that aspect just because I don't have 
you know, all this stuff. But, but we will say, how do we do it in the clinical research and, and what is, based upon maybe some of the mechanisms of hydrogen gas, maybe um, okay, what are some how, how do we do it in clinical research? Yeah, well, the way, so we just did a study that we're, we're um, in metabolic syndrome, actually using the tablets also, because we wanted to try this high dose um, and, and see if we could replicate some of the earlier studies that, that, that uh, you actually mentioned earlier. Um, and we used three tablets, uh, three times a day. And the, and the idea there was that way they would, they would take the tablet, they would put it in the water, as soon as it would dissolve, uh, they would drink it immediately, in, in basically in one gulp, mm -hmm. so that you get as much hydrogen gas as possible. And, and that would get a high level of concentration in, in their cells, and they did that three times a day. Um, because I think, you know, when, when you look at, uh, on a cellular level, you want to, the concentration of hydrogen gas has to reach a certain micromolar concentration, a certain you know, level in the cell in order for it to have a therapeutic effect. So by getting a high dose of hydrogen, just an intermittent high, high level of exposure at once, um, could be very important to get that high concentration and also because hydrogen is more of a gaseous signal modulator That's right. important. Right. Um, so you had to get to get that effect. So I, I like I like that idea. In fact uh, You'll find this interesting that earlier study. I talked about with the APOE knockout yeah. um, They originally were doing this with inhalation actually 24-hour uh, Exposure to hydrogen gas because you're like hey if hydrogen gas is this uh, molecule then total exposure to it could be great. So essentially, in the beginning, they, they saw a beneficial effect. And then it kind of plateaued, and then it kind of went away. And, but, and what, what some of the researchers are thinking is, um, some of the methodology and things, open up, the, open up the animal cage, hydrogen gas would come out. So it was almost an intermittent type of exposure. Uh -huh. They switched it to hydrogen and water, and then the, the benefits just continued to, to be there, and they didn't go away. And a similar study was done with the, in, in uh, Parkinson's disease, where they exposed the rats 24-7 to hydrogen gas, and then the other group drank hydrogen water, the other group just had fiber, lactulose, uh, actually, and the other group um, gave, were given intermittent exposure to hydrogen gas. And if it was found that the continuous exposure of hydrogen gas had no benefit hmm. in, 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 in Parkinson's disease. Lactulose didn't really have any benefit either, actually, in this, in this model. In, in other cases, yeah, it yeah, they may. Um, and then the intermittent exposure actually was statistically beneficial. So again, we see it's important to have this intermittent exposure, but none of those were as effective as simply drinking hydrogen-rich water. So Tyler, is there anybody who really ought to do this? Or I mean, is it good for everybody? Who, who should do this? So first off, because hydrogen gas is safe, so it, people can use it, for, you know, children, pregnant people, and anybody can do it. Um, so I would say the people who uh, want to take that risk, if you will, because it is safe, but you know, we don't, like I said, we don't know all the clinical effectiveness and everything, try it. A lot of people I have just reported back so many anecdotal testimonials. Granted, who knows, maybe it's all placebo, right? But, True. but it's something that is safe, and the preliminary preclinical and clinical studies are, are very promising. So you know, those who are interested in you know, your anti-aging and your health and your wellness, or you know, maybe if you're trying some sort of intervention, it's just not working, just, just try it. I mean, just, just give it a try and see if it helps you or not. And if it doesn't, okay. If it does, that's great. Um, but, but I guess I would, I would I'd just be cautious because, again, we don't know if it really works and to what extent and everything. But, if, but for those who are open-minded and biohacking type area and then trying to find some, a solution, well, we do have something that has some preliminary data. So for some people, when they first take the molecular hydrogen, and again, this could all be placebo, but these are just some things that I have frequent heard of people who are trying it. Sometimes they automatically feel like almost like a head rush of, of uh, even some mental clarity or just like, wow, they feel something. Some people who uh, are often in pain, they, they'll be able to, their pain just drastically decreases, especially like at nighttime, people have like aches and pains and can't really get a good night's sleep. Um, they report that they're um, able to sleep through the night with all the, all the aches and pains. And then just having more energy. We, we did publish several articles actually on exercise performance, for both in the el elderly as well as in um, younger people, that hydrogen may increase, um, a decreased rate of preserved exertion, decrease uh, lactate or lactic acid, people call you know f muscle fatigue basically. So, and then there's also was a pu publication in, in, in healthy individuals that just decreased 
uh, basically it's called the, the sympathetic nerve activation, so mm -hmm. it makes you more parasympathetic. So some people, when they take hydrogen, they, they, all, they feel not only a sense of, of uh, mental clarity, but almost more, more calm, calm, more yeah. kind of relaxed. And it has an, like an uh, anti-anxiety and antidepressive. And there's an, some animal studies. In fact, we, we actually did a study too in um, helping with the res increasing resilience to acute and chronic stress. And so people just kind of notice they're able to handle stress better and, and be more uh, parasympathetic and um, just have more energy and c cognitive clarity. Can I put it in my coffee? Uh, yeah, I mean, as you could. I, I guess one of the concerns would be because hydrogen gas is, is the solubility is based upon temperature, so right. it, it would probably evaporate very quickly. Quicker. Yeah. How about a smoothie? Uh, probably the same thing, dude. Because you probably it probably uh, it, it depends on your method of dissolving the hydrogen gas into the smoothie. But again, you don't probably don't take the smoothie in a few minutes. It probably takes a whole right. while. So. And particularly if you made it hydrogen water and then made your smoothie, probably yeah, the agitation gonna, is gone. Yeah, exactly. Ah, darn. Okay. Well, that's great information. All right. What do, you detract, what do you say to your detractors that, oh, come on now, hydrogen, water, really? <laughs> yeah. Are I, you just the next alkaline water? <laughs> <laughs> you, well, it's funny because I feel myself sometimes on the same side of like, yeah, uh, is this legitimate? Like, it's, it's crazy. Hydrogen gas is a neutral molecule. And, and so to, to, for it to have a biological effect, my background's biochemistry. Right. And, and I'm just like, this is so weird. This is so strange. So it wasn't until I was in Japan in 2013 at Goya University and like doing some of the research and I seen these effects. And, and now, of course, I see, I've seen them many times. And I'm like, something is going on here. Um, and so, yeah, to my response is, you know, look at like nitric oxide, for example. For, for back in the 70s, it was proposed that this endothelial uh, derived rele releasing factor was a gas, nitric oxide. And people wanted to laugh that out, like, no, gases can't do that, especially, you know, something is... Particularly as, laughing gas. Yeah, yeah, right? You know, it just, it didn't make, it didn't make sense to them that nitric oxide would, would do that. Um, but then, of course, it was later confirmed a decade later, and then a decade after that, they won the no Nobel uh, yeah, Prize. Yeah, win the Nobel Prize right? for something that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So right. who, who knows? But it's, it's very We're looking at the next w Nobel Prize winner here. Uh, no, no. <laughs> nah, maybe hydrogen gas will be subject to Nobel. I do. It's possible, but right. I, I'm just, yeah. All right. Tyler, it's been great having you on. Where can people find you, find out more about you? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so my website, molecularhydrogeninstitute.com. Again, we're just we're trying to just provide some information, some education, um, so you can learn what is and what is not hydrogen. Um, I do post stuff I just, on some of my social media. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Tyler W. LeBaron is, is my IG, is what you say, right? Yeah, Instagram handle. Um, anyway, you're welcome to follow me, and I post some of the stuff when I'm out of the country doing research and you know, some of the new publications that, that we do. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fun journey, so just join the hydrogen revolution. <laughs> All right, very good. All right, thanks again for coming on. My pleasure. All right, it's time for audience question. A YouTube viewer asks, are muscle building and longevity inverse related? And if so, what is a good middle ground? That's actually a really good question. And it comes up because we talk about mTOR, and uh, those of you who have read my books or listened to our podcast, uh, mTOR is actually very important in producing, we can measure the effect of mTOR by insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1. And we know that IGF-1, when it's at high levels, actually promotes muscle growth. And that's why bodybuilders, for instance, who are trying to have huge muscles, want large amounts of IGF-1. When we're young, we produce large amounts of IGF-1, and that gradually decreases as we get older. And in fact, all of my super old individuals who are in their late 90s, early 100s, who are thriving, actually have very low levels of insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1. And that appears to be one of the markers for successful aging. Okay, so how do we balance the two? There are very good studies that show the more muscle mass you carry into late life, the better off you are in so many ways. For one thing, muscle is the consumer of sugars and proteins that you eat. And the more avidly the muscle consumes sugar and protein, 
the lower your insulin level is, the lower your blood sugar is, and the lower your hemoglobin A1C is, all of which correlates with improved longevity. Uh, I recently uh, spent a day with uh, my friend Walter Longo's associate over in Lisbon, and we were talking about this very effect. They firmly believe that after the age of 65, you should increase your protein consumption because you don't absorb protein well after the age of 65. I actually disagree with them because my research shows that people don't absorb protein well after 65 because of damage to the intestinal wall. And in my clinics, we find that people who are very protein deficient as elderly individuals, when we get lectins out of their diet and we restore their microbiome, even though we're actually decreasing the amount of protein they eat, their protein levels in their blood go up. So don't be afraid of you know, you, I gotta build muscle all the time, but you don't absolutely need a lot of protein to build muscle. So, but it's a great question. All right, that's it for the Dr. Gundry podcast. We will see you next week, and please visit Tyler. Fascinating stuff. That's all for now. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.